I have become what the world would call a fanatic. In fact, all true Orthodox believers are fanatics. Such fanaticism is justified by the fact that the Orthodox Church is the one true Church of Christ. It is the reality of which Roman Catholicism and all other churches are but pale shadows at best. This may seem like an extreme statement to you, and as proof, I can only ask you to discover it for yourself. Those who are not true Orthodox Christians belong to the new Christianity, the Christianity of Antichrist. The Pope of Rome, and practically everyone else today, speaks of transforming the world by Christianity. Priests and nuns take part in demonstrations for racial equality and similar causes. These have nothing to do with Christianity. They do nothing but distract men from their true goal, which is the kingdom of heaven. The coming age of peace, unity, and brotherhood, if it comes, will be the reign of Antichrist. It will be Christian in name, but satanic in spirit. Everyone today seeks happiness on earth, and they think this is Christianity. True Orthodox Christians know that the age of persecutions, which began under the Bolsheviks, is still with us, that only by much sorrow and tribulation are we made fit to enter into the kingdom of heaven. One feels the noose begin the time with which the official church will try to strangle, and one treasures all the more every contact with like-minded souls who want the real orthodoxy. We've heard no more about the Metropolia, but the general picture is clear. Whether now or after some delay, whether Yakovos joins now or after a year or two, the autocephalous church is here, and everyone who has not love for true orthodoxy will rush to join, and they will wage war against us, not because we are of any external threat, only a few will leave them, but because their consciences aren't clean, and the Synod represents their conscience. I think 1970 is the crisis year for American Orthodoxy, towards the Metropolia, the Greek Archdiocese, etc. Our attitude has not been entirely definite yet, but now they force us to define ourselves and them, which is all to the good. A few of the people who might have continued with them and gradually lost their orthodoxy until it was too late to get it back will now step away from them. And it will all be to the good if the Synod now, as in 1927, excommunicates them and informs everyone that their bishops are not bishops, their priests are not priests, their sacraments are not sacraments. If Yakovos joins them, he falls under the same ban. Up to now, our older priests haven't understood the Greek situation, but now, if Yakovos joins them, they will because they do understand the Soviet church situation. One of our San Francisco cathedral priests, who was somewhat soft on the Metropolia, has come out now with a good attack on them, because, as he says, regarding Moscow, the situation is absolutely clear. There is no room for any other interpretation than ours. However, I must assure you that among those Orthodox faithful who value their faith above everything else, and who are aware of what is happening in the world, your letter did not at all bring ridicule to you but instead has inspired and strengthened many in the fight for true orthodoxy today. And truly, it is important for our small flock of true orthodox Christians to have contact with each other, for the days are evil, and many seek to destroy the orthodox church today, even some of those who are called orthodox bishops. Here in America, we are very familiar with the apostasy of Anathagoras and company, and unfortunately, the other national jurisdictions in America are hardly any better. All of them fraternize and pray with Catholics and Protestants and are ashamed to tell the heterodox that they have wandered far from the truth, which is only in orthodoxy. The members of our Russian church outside of Russia, almost alone, stand up and fight for the purity of our holy orthodox doctrine and practice, and for this we are slandered and called names everywhere. But here, at least, we are perfectly free to speak the truth, which is not the case in many countries. We have heard that the Archimandrite Kyprian Contesambus has been reduced to the lay state by the official Church of Greece. We beg you to use your authority to protect him and his priesthood against any act of violence from the official Church of the government. In America, we know Archimandrite Kyprian Contesambus as a highly respected priest of the Old Calendar's jurisdiction, which is recognized by the Holy Synod of the Russian Church outside of Russia and many bishops outside of Greece. We, in common with many Orthodox Christians in America, wish to believe that the Greek government will respect the sincere religious convictions of those in Greece who have separated for canonical reasons and for reasons of conscience from the official church, and will allow Father Kiprian to freely practice his Orthodox faith and exercise his priesthood without interference from the government. If, despite our hope, 
Our commander at Kiprian should be subjected to any kind of violence on part of the church or government. We and many thousands of Orthodox Christians outside of Greece can only regard this as an act of persecution against the true Orthodox Church and faithful, about which we will be obliged to inform the readers of our magazine. We were only confirmed in our judgment that if the Greeks look to our Synod bishops for confirmation of their stand for true orthodoxy, we in the Synod look to you zealot Greeks for inspiration in true and unbending orthodoxy. Then, a few hours after Father Theodortos left, we were visited by Hieromonk Theodore, newly moved to San Francisco, surnamed Hoyens, not the one who was tortured by Father Pantelaimon. And it turns out that he fully recognizes Anathogoros until he preaches a heresy, long since and is against the old calendarists and views the Athenite zealots as fanatics who will end in priestless sectarianism. I fear his views are all too close to the organizational view that prevails among many of our priests, and, one fears, even higher. The Sobor will doubtless reveal much concerning this. Please remember that we are with you Greek zealots in this, and keep us informed of crucial developments, decisions, etc. The day of unconscious orthodoxy is past. And truly, it is not enough for Russians to sit aloof and just wait for the restoration of Russia, which, when it comes, may take a surprising form and find most Russians off guard. We are more than ever concerned to preserve the independence of our monastery, so that, if, God forbid, there should come a division in the Synod, we will be free to act according to conscience. Surely the few true Orthodox Christians of these last times should have more sympathy for each other. A disposition to believe the best possible and not the worst, and if necessary, to forgive the forgivable. But even high circles are indifferent to the fighting orthodoxy that we want. It sometimes occurs to us that we are really all fools who are doing the fighting. Hopelessly outnumbered, we march into battle with the full expectation of being cut down, if not from in front, then from behind, which is worse. But glory be to God, let us fight while it is day and we have the chance. Truly, it is not for an earthly kingdom that we are fighting, and if we have to stop for politics, we are not going to do much fighting. We are very much inspired by the new catacomb documents, which we will start setting up next week, which give probably the best insight yet into true Orthodox life in the USSR. With sharp observations on the use of obedience and humility for political ends, these weapons are used not only in the USSR. More than once you have mentioned your concern for getting the true orthodox message to the Russians. After these last two weeks, we are more convinced than ever that we really should begin something in this direction. No one else is going to. But also, we are more than ever convinced that a ruling bishop will not only disapprove, but squash our attempt. If we in the battle for true orthodoxy do not have tolerance for each other's weaknesses and mistakes, even those expressed in print, there is no hope for any of us or for the Orthodox mission today. As I recall, Kalamiros made the same point in Against False Union, and we have impressed it on Alexei and others many times. From this point of view, it is certainly very unfortunate that the old calendars printed Father Ephraim's letter in full and with names given. For what? To call to a debate among laborers in the mission field? There must be more caution and tact here. Christ is risen. We trust that you and your family spent a spiritually profitable Pascha. We had a peaceful and quiet day here. After going to the world earlier in the week to receive Holy Communion and being there impressed by the deep spiritual bond which unites us, supposed desert dwellers with the simple Russian faithful, the sincere and striving converts, and all the true Orthodox people today. Father, let us not introduce that kind of strictness into the church abroad. Let us thank God that you and Father Pantelaimon have been allowed to exist freely and mature in your own rhythm within the church abroad. Then let others do also. Particularly if in general their approach seems sound, and if they are getting sound counsel, there does not have to be an absolute agreement on all issues. By which I mean specifically such things as the relation between confession and communion, the authenticity of the Shroud of Turin, the attitude towards contemporary ideology. For us to be part of the same true Orthodox Church and its mission. As you know, from the beginning we have given our full support to the Greeks in our Synod. Fathers Pantelaimon, Nekatas, and others, because we have seen them to be zealots of true orthodoxy and an inspiration for others to follow. Occasionally, it is true, we have noted in Father Nekatas' orthodox Christian witness some statements that seem rather narrow, and a few completely unnecessary comments that do more harm than good, such as his comments on the Metropolitan's Mexican bishop. 
However, we have always excused these failings, recognizing that no one is perfect and that all of us in the missionary field within our Russian church abroad must always be willing to forgive and defend each other and not make big issues out of points which are of secondary importance. And so we have never mentioned these things to the Greeks or tried to correct them. If it were not for such loving hearts which beat with holy orthodoxy, the fire of true orthodoxy would be completely absent from our midst today. In future, we trust in God the loving, zealous acts of such men, which of course are not at all uncanonical because they have nothing to do with any canons, whatever, whether they be hierarchs or priests or monks or simple laymen, will be praised and lauded by the whole church because throughout the church's history, these are the stuff of which orthodoxy is made in practice. If you wish to know the principle in which Vladika Nektari and others who practice living orthodoxy have acted, and that which inspires even us poor ones just to go on under an extremely difficult and unfavorable spiritual climate, which you cold heart does not even see, it is the principle of catacombness, of nourishing in secret those sprouts of true orthodoxy, which are not being encouraged in official orthodox circles. In the time ahead, the devil will be using every chance to get true Orthodox Christians upset at each other over matter big and mostly small. We must firmly try not to take the bait. Against St. Gregory Palamas and other Hezekiah's fathers who taught the true Orthodox doctrine of the uncreated light of Mount Tabor, there rose up the Western rationalist Barlam. Taking advantage of the fact that St. Mox was a confessor, in one passage had called this light of the Transfiguration a symbol of theology, Barlaam taught that this light was not a manifestation of the divinity, but only something bodily, not literally divine light, but only a symbol of it. In general, the feeling of being abandoned is present almost everywhere among true Orthodox Christians today, but our contact with each other is already a source of strength and encouragement. The more we hear the Jordanville Sabor, or at least the Bishop Sabor, after everyone else left, the more discouraged we are. We still don't understand what the purpose of the decree on the old believers. The question of the canonization of Blessed Xenia was postponed, evidently from what Vladika Nektari tells us, because it is unimportant. There is no support shown for the zealots of Mount Athos who are suffering persecution for true orthodoxy. Our friends in Greece write us that the old countess were expecting help from us, and Patriarch Demetrius also waited to see whether our bishops would speak out. If not, then the persecution can continue. And the epistles to the Paris and Metropolia groups? What feeble statements, as though the differences between us were nothing more than jurisdictional squabbles, which can be ended with a few negotiations, instead of a questioning of confessing the truth as against going along with the spirit of the times. We feel very much the dangers ahead of us. True orthodoxy can be swallowed up by half-hearted orthodoxy, which is actually only a stage on the path to fake orthodoxy, Constantinople, Metropolia, etc. The schism of Evlogi in the Metropolia was a blessing from God, because it cut off many Ron members, the fake intelligentsia that wants to make a new orthodoxy. The talk now of reconciliation with these groups shows that within our church, true orthodoxy is in danger of being lost. The enemy works full time, and so we must keep struggling too to make true orthodoxy known. But we give thanks to God for everything, and deep down we are peaceful. Several bishops have told us themselves that the epistle sent by these groups was very poorly and hastily done, without even mention of the necessity to be one in the truth. As a result, the Metropolitan America jumped at the opportunity to seduce us into having communion with them, and we really feared, at the time we wrote the article in the Catacomb Church in Metropolitan Theodosius, there might be some kind of hasty union, which would be disastrous for the cause of true orthodoxy and would have caused a schism, even if perhaps only a few would have been bold enough to separate from this union. Now, glory be to God, our Metropolitan Philorette has come out with a strong statement that communion is impossible. But the Metropolia certainly won the propaganda battle in Russian newspapers by showing how lacking in love we are for refusing to have communion with them, as if we hate Christ himself. The ordinary Russian people are unaware enough to fall for that kind of propaganda. But alas, this whole thing was the fault of our well-meaning but unaware church figures who are very much under the influence of intellectual fashion. Others of our bishops are aware, however, and there was even one case where one bishop who was in favor of the union with the Metropolia was not allowed to serve in the diocese of another bishop. If the worst does happen, and Father Pantelaimon goes to the Matthewites, then we will probably have to publish an attack, 
against the Matthewites as an error on the right hand, with true orthodoxy standing between the modernists on the one hand and the legalist fanatics on the other hand. But if Father Pantelaimon does leave the Synod, it will be very difficult for us zealots to remain, because as you know, some of our bishops are trying to maintain communion with eucanimical orthodoxy, which is a disastrous and fatal path. But we trust that God allows all these difficult and bitter trials to come upon us for our salvation and so that we can be the help to others. But we are peaceful about all this, seeing that it only makes us more sober. We must simply struggle all the harder to give the real feeling for orthodoxy. The number of true orthodox Christians seems to diminish rather than increase, and the devil attacks us always from some unexpected direction. Our own experience with converts, we have had four new ones with us this summer, teaches us how difficult it is for them to absorb true orthodoxy, and how easy it is for them, because of their self-opinion and soft life, to fall for some faker. We ourselves have a feeling, based on nothing very definite as yet, that the best hope for preserving true orthodoxy in the years ahead will lie in such small gatherings of believers, as much as possible, one in mind and soul. The history of the 20th century has already shown us that we cannot expect too much from the church organization. There, even apart from heresies, the spirit of the world has become very strong. Archbishop of Erdke and our own Bishop Nectari also have warned us to prepare for the catacomb times ahead, when the grace of God may even be taken away from the church organization, and only isolated groups of believers will remain. Soviet Russia already gives us an example of what we may expect, only worse, for the times do not get better. Before going ahead, we must stop and find out where we are. We wish to be zealots for true orthodoxy, and our church leaders have indicated clearly that we must have no contact with the Moscow Patriarchate and similarly enslaved churches, must refrain from participating in ecumenist activities, and must be aware that ecumenism is eating away the very orthodox fiber of most of the orthodox churches, beginning with Constantinople, and must be zealously pursuing a path of true orthodoxy ourselves, not only in outward acts, but especially in spiritual life, without falling into the false zealotry, not according to knowledge, a point that Bodhika Averki especially emphasized. About the latter danger, we have been learning much of late from the situation of the old calendars in Greece, which can help us to avoid some mistakes on the right side. We fear that the future for true orthodoxy may be indeed a dismissal, as Dr. Kalamiros paints it, with isolated groups of believers cut off from each other and even anathematizing each other over points of strictness and correctness. While we have a free Russian church outside of Russia, we should treasure it, even while we may have disagreements amongst ourselves over questions such as break communion. If some in our church are going to insist that their opinions on such must prevail, there will be discord and possibly schism, which would indeed do more harm than any possible good, for it will prove to canonical orthodoxy that true orthodoxy is only a conglomeration of fighting sects. May God preserve us from this. This is what made us write the article. Our correctness must always be accompanied by humility, but with sufficient doubt in our own opinions as to listen to what those who differ may say, without calling them betrayers or heretics. Thus far, the circle of betrayers and heretics is fairly clear, and we should not cease to denounce their path or remain separate from them. But with those who sincerely wish to remain in the tradition of orthodoxy, we must have a spirit of consolation and openness to listen. Orthodoxy, by remaining unchanged, has become so out of harmony with the world, and the world itself has become more glamorous and magical, a symptom of chilasm, that those who wish to be true Orthodox Christians today must suffer in their own souls the power of this disharmony between true and false life before emerging into a relatively stable Orthodox way of life. Be patient. You're suffering through this painful state, without losing the deep-down desire to be Orthodox in spite of everything, will do you much good. By the way, your experience is not really so different from that of the blessed Augustine, especially in the last months of his conversion when he saw clearly the truth of Christianity, but just couldn't commit himself to it. May God be our help. We recently exchanged friendly communications with Father Pantelaimon and pray that our relations will never become hardened. We see many signs of late that the missionary movement of true orthodoxy in America is growing and deepening. We would like to think that some of the recent shocks and conflicts are perhaps growing pains rather than signs of deep disagreements. May God grant us all the humility and love to grow and not to fight. You receive safely the photographs of your monastery and plan to print also an article on it, together with the life. The articles will be taken chiefly from your words, with, of course, the personal controversial references removed. We have heard little from Father Pantelaimon of late, but there have been several indications that perhaps he will step back from a too fanatical position. 
Several of the Greek priests in our church were upset with the article on Metropolitan Philaret, but I think they may be beginning to realize at last this is how our bishops really think. We pray that God will grant peace to a small flock, and that small differences of opinion will not destroy the unity of all who should be fighting against the real apostasy of our times, that represented by the frightful Eighth Eucumal Council, which seems to be drawing closer. In a way, we welcome this robber council, for it will be perhaps so obviously anti-Orthodox that some will see it and withdraw from that ruinous path. That is another reason for true Orthodox Christians to be not fanatical, but moderate, holding a path of true Orthodoxy and not sectarianism in the face of such temptations. Many people now have been awakened to Orthodoxy and to the need for a true Orthodoxy, without modernistic distortions. Even those who are too zealous can yet mature and overcome the mistakes of youth. The number of eager ears willing to listen to the message of Orthodoxy in English has never been greater. With regard to jurisdictions, we are in full communion with the Greek Old Counter's jurisdiction of Archbishop Oxyntios in Athens and with the Catacomb Church in Russia. With other jurisdictions, our relations are strained and in some cases broken altogether, owing to the sad history of 20th century orthodoxy outlined above. Our church as a whole simply refuses to accept the excommunications hurled by the various jurisdictions against each other under the heated circumstances of controversy, but on the other hand, a state of free intercommunion does not exist between us. In our own case, we would not be able to concelebrate with the priests of any other jurisdiction. As for laymen, whose responsibility in these sad divisions is much less, but who still must be striving to be conscious of responsible Christians, those who wish to receive Holy Communion must go to confession first and must be prepared to accept instruction from the priest in preserving oneself in true orthodoxy. Most orthodox people today, at least in America, do not seem very open to taking such guidance and would find our approach too strict. To name but one problem that could arise, Many decrees of the Greek and Russian churches in the 20th century have forbidden the giving of Holy Communion to members of Masonic lodges. In open disobedience to these decrees, many priests and even bishops of several jurisdictions do give communion to them. Our church does not. We are no fanatics on this question, but we are required to explain to Orthodox Christians who in their ignorance have joined Masonic lodges that there are religious aspects to Masonry which make it incompatible with membership in the Orthodox Church. Please pray also for our missionary labors here. Just in the last year, we've been able to begin missionary parishes in Redding and Etna, California, and Medford and Woodboard, Oregon. Three of them English parishes, and the last one Russian. Just last weekend, Father Alexei Young was ordained priest to take care of Etna and Medford. We all feel very strongly the difficulties of preaching true orthodoxy in these terrible times. We also see very clearly God's help in our humble labors. In so many of our Orthodox people today, especially converts, one can see a frightful thing. Much talk about exalted truths and experiences of true Orthodoxy, but mixed with pride and a sense of one's own importance for being in on something which most people don't see. From this comes also the criticism against which you've already been warned. May God keep your heart soft and filled with love for Christ and your fellow man. If you would be able to have a spiritual father with whom you can confide the feelings of your heart and trust his judgment, all this will be easier for you, but if it's pleasing to God for you to have such a spiritual father, it will come naturally, as all things do in spiritual life, with time, patience, suffering, and coming better to know yourself. Some years ago, we asked one of our true Orthodox theologians, Father Michael Pomazansky of Jordanville, what he thought of the opinion that Blessed Augustine was a heretic, and he only replied that yes, he did distort several Orthodox doctrines as Father Michael has set forth himself in his book on dogmatic theology. But he could not at all understand this campaign against the man, who, after all, is the father of the church and on the whole taught correctly. There are already enough of us aware of the Pantelaemon problem, which in essence boils down, I think, to a question of a dead orthodoxy of the head, of calculation, versus the true orthodoxy of the heart. If we begin now to look to the sources of a true Orthodox inspiration, to nourish ourselves on them, to communicate them to others, to speak out when the need arises on problems of the day, we can have a substantial influence ourselves in overcoming the poisons already in the air and introducing a fresh air that can inspire and save them from dead legalism and correctness. The whole Orthodox Church in the free world is in a state of near paralysis. Our Russian church abroad is better off in that it has at least kept more of the traditions and piety of the past and doesn't betray orthodoxy in the eucumical movement. 
But God has given us the talent of freedom, and we who can walk and write and print have an obligation to inspire those we can with the true orthodoxy of the heart. I'm not against a polemical article here and there, your articles in the last issue were good, but such articles have to be only incidental to something more important that is being said, and should have a compassionate tone that rises above mere polemics and anger. We had a very successful pilgrimage and summer courses here these past two weeks, with large doses of positive inspiration, information on the suffering Christians in Russia, together with warnings about the perils to living true orthodoxy today, including our Greeks mentioned by name, and ending with the baptisms of two new converts. Here and there, positive things are going on in the church. It's up to us to help increase them. What this means for the future, I don't know. May God preserve us. We wish to be friends with everyone who is struggling for true orthodoxy. But the spirit coming from Father Pantalaemon seems to be different from that of the humble strugglers we know, both in the Russian and Greek churches. We've tried gently to communicate some of this to Father Pantalaemon and Father Nikitas, but up to now they've only replied with their correctness and have indicated no desire to be more humble about their pretensions. Now we can appreciate a little better the suffering we must all go through to be true Orthodox Christians in these terrible times. I know God will continue to preserve his church, and I believe he will prosper the true Orthodox mission which is just beginning in our church. The 150 to 200 souls who attended our pilgrimage and courses this year are eager to learn more, and not at all caught up in the artificial fanaticism that the Greeks propagate. But the tragedy of souls caught in a self-willed schism will be incalculable. 